Contact Fire. Hi, Amber. It's Kevin Toy with the Focus Hunting Podcast. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. So, Amber, a gentleman wrote in and told us about this magnificent shop called Cantec Firearms in Cascar, BC. Can you tell us a bit about Cantec Firearms? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, we are a small retailing store, um, but we are a large gunsmithing shop. So, while we do sell a little bit of new firearms, we mainly focus on the gunsmithing end of it. Gotcha. How long have you guys been in business down there? Five years. Five years. Well, that's great. Where can we find you guys? Catholic RBC. We are located at 163 Columbia Ave. Awesome. That's great. Okay. Well, if anyone is in the Casco area, be sure to stop in and see Amber and the rest of the great folks down at Cantac Firearms. And thanks to you, Amber. All the best to you over the holiday season. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, Amber. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. But uh, if you're ready, maybe we'll just dive into this podcast. Let's just do this, yeah. Okay. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to another episode of the Focus Hunting Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Ed Hensel. Ed, uh, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Ed, can you give us a bit of a background on yourself? So, a long-time outdoorsman, and now I'm a volunteer with Central Okanagan Search and Rescue. Um, also do a little bit of hunting and fishing in my spare time. Gotcha. How long have you been uh, been hunting, and how did you get involved? I grew up in Vernon, um, and I started hunting as a little kid, uh, fetching the grouse that my dad would shoot, and uh, it grew from there. Um, I didn't get my first deer until I was 20 um, in Grand Forks, and I hate to say it, but I go back there every year to punch a tag. Uh, I'm a meat hunter, so it's uh, hard to be very discerning when there's so many animals around. Yeah. Um, How long have you been involved with Search and Rescue? Um, This is my fifth year now um, with Central Okanagan Search and Rescue. Uh, I was on a few tasks as a conversion volunteer years earlier um, when I was dirt biking um, and got helped helped out the Vernon Search and Rescue, I guess it was at the time. But I've only been with COSAR for five years. COSAR, uh, Central Okanagan Search and Rescue. Yes, Um, one of the busier search and rescue organizations, if I might add, in the province. Oh, is that right? Yeah, we're. I think we're in the top five. Obviously, North Shore gets all the glory, and they're pretty darn busy. And then I think Kent Harrison um, in the Fraser Valley. And then there's a bit of a toss-up between Vern and us and Kamloops, I believe. Uh, average all about 60 to 70 tasks a year. Oh, wow. So more than more than a call per week. Yeah, yeah. And it's getting heavier, obviously, with, the, uh, with COVID. I think people are enjoying the outdoors more, but... People are also pushing their limits a little more. Oh, yeah, I bet. I probably see a lot more people in the backcountry that probably don't have as much experience as they should when they're when they're setting out. Yeah, I believe that's the case, to be honest, just people getting in over their heads. Central Okanagan Search and Rescue, can you just uh, tell us maybe what that is and, and how that all got started? Yeah, so it's we're one of the older ones. Uh, we started in the 50s, uh, back, you know, back when... Kelowna was only, you know, 30,000, 20,000 people. Uh, apparently a little girl got lost along the shores of Okanagan Lake and the group got together and uh, found her. And then they realized there's no official organization in this area to do that. So they set up uh, what was then Kelowna Search and Rescue. And it's been going ever since. It started pretty small, you know, equipment stored in people's garages and then um, storage lockers. And it's gradually got to where now we have 50 members um, an old fire hall out by the airport is our base. Um, we've got three trucks, six snowmobiles, six ATVs, a track UTV, and enough uh, equipment to get people out of most scenarios. Um, and of course, we've had to expand our equipment as um, people explore the backcountry further and farther with new technology, right? Like 30 yeah. years ago, there was no such thing as an ATV or a, a quad anyhow. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so people, yeah, with the advancement of technology, I guess they're definitely, they're getting further out in the backcountry and I guess that makes it harder for you guys. For sure, which is why we get, you know, accumulate more equipment, right? And why we need larger storage spaces for all this gear. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned you have roughly 50 uh, volunteer members. What's the recruitment like for you guys? Like, um, 
what does it take to be a member? Kind of what do you look for in, when you're recruiting members? Um, that's a really good question. So this it's not exactly what you'd think. Uh, you need basically two things. So you need to be knowledgeable about the outdoors, right? And we all, in our group, we all have specific skill sets. We have some guys that are great snowmobilers. We have hunters. We have hikers. Um, and they all have that competency, right? You know, not to go out, uh, you know, in a t-shirt when it's, you know, in the evening, you know, not to dress for going to the lake when you're going to the summit of Little White. Um, so there's that common sense. And then there's the availability. Simply, you need to be available because these calls come in at all sorts of times, usually at night. Um, you know, Sunday nights seems to be the most popular. So you have to have an understanding boss that will let you maybe make up your missed Monday morning um, because you've been up all night searching for somebody. Um, and I'm fortunate, you know, I'm a college professor, so I can't miss any classes, but all my prep work, all my administration work I can do on weekends or whenever. Um, and so my, you know, college understands we have uh, business owners, we have web designers, we have um, uh, construction workers that can kind of make uh, their schedule work around these calls. So that's the other part of it. So outdoor competency and simply the ability to be there. Right. So you mentioned you have, you've got a number of, uh, of volunteers that are, have different key aspects of, of what they're good at. So on certain calls, say there's a lost person that uh, he was snowshoeing or he was cross-country skiing too far, or he got lost or he hasn't shown up. Do you call the people who have the most training or most ability with, say, uh, snowmobiles? Or how does that work? How, who gets the call first? You guys have a list and you run through that? Or do you have that's a, a good... specific list? Like do certain members have specific? What's the, how does that well, work? Let, let me go through a call really quickly. So what happens is, you know, uh, somebody's waiting at home and their loved one didn't, you know, didn't show up when they're supposed to. So you, you would tend to call 911 and uh, missing persons go to the police, right? So the police get some information. And if this person is missing outside of basically the city in a wilderness area, they'll call us. Um, and we have what are called search managers in charge of searches. So they'll take down the information and figure out, okay, so we have somebody who is snowshoeing in Greystokes. So we need a snowmobile team. We might need uh, members who are on the avalanche team if they're gonna go into, there's a couple places that slide over in the Greystokes. And um, so they'll put out the call, but they'll also ask for, um, you know, just general members because there's a lot of stuff that goes on back at base and also a, there, you know, we all have a certain level of competency, so we can all, you know, we've all snowshoed before, right? So um, they will call and depending on when and where, anywhere from, you know, 10 to 25 members will show up and uh, the search manager will organize those resources, generally sending out a hasty team or, you know, a strike team to go for the high probability area. You know, if somebody was snowshoeing to the summit of say, I don't know, um, one of the mountains in Greystoke, um, maybe they would send a team to go straight there, right? A high probability area. And then we'd have other people that would maybe be looking for tracks or calling an air support or whatever the, the case may be. Um, so you don't have to be super specialized in any one area, except for perhaps rope team and swift water rescue team. Um, generally a general member, what we call a, a ground search and rescue member, uh, is competent enough in most aspects of outdoor recreation that they can do the, you know, the snowshoeing or the hiking, or that sort of thing. Right. So back to recruitment, what kind of training do you have to go through as a, as a new member of, okay. uh, of COSAR? So we generally have an intake every couple years. Um, we usually start recruiting in the fall um, and we're, we shortlist people. Uh, do an interview hike to make sure, you know, see how they work as a team, which is hugely important. And then we start the training in January. Obviously, this year is off because of COVID, but um, they, they basically have a 90 hour course that teaches the fundamentals of search and rescue. Right. So um, it's basically three hours every once a week and then every second Saturday, a full day. Uh, they do this. Um, they do an evaluation well, basically, it's an overnight camp at the end. And if everything is good, uh, they are now what we call members in training. And so they have the fundamental 
um, which is the equivalent, I would argue, almost of a high school education, right? So they have the fundamentals and then they can specialize, right? So if they want extra training, um, they can go take a rope course or they can take um, a tracking course or get certified on ATVs or UTV or snowmobiles or whatever it is. Um, so they build these competencies. And um, sometimes it takes years. You know, I'm still, you know, I took a wilderness first responder first aid course a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, so they're still building on stuff even five years later. Once your members become full-time members, what training, like what annual guidelines do you have set out for your for your members for training? Is there like, do they have to stay physically fit? So there is, um, yeah, there is no hard and fast rules on fitness. There's um, people started, I would argue, sort of self-select, right? Obviously, if you need a hasty team, people that are, are you know, uh, competent to go down a hiking trail really quickly. Um, we have guys that have raced, you know, World Cup cross country. Uh, we've got people that are you know, ultra marathoners. I think we had a guy who did a 250 mile race last year. Um, so those people would be selected to go on the hasty team. Right. And to ride a quad, you just want somebody who is a certified, but also, you know, the most skilled members, right. Since we only have six quads and we do have members that bring their own, but um, so uh, there is sort of a self-selection. But you also, every year, you're sort of expected to show up to at least 50% of the meetings. So we have uh, training once a week. And then uh, we have, like I said, we have 60 plus tasks. Um, you're, you're expected to show up for at least half of those. Again, it's all volunteer, um, but that's why we have 50 members. You know, if some members can't make it, you might be on vacation out of town. Um, then, you know, your other colleagues will step in. So the call goes out to everybody, but only those that can can actually respond, um, show up or, or check in first and then um, show up at staging. Right. So you, you mentioned it's all volunteer and, and they're required to, to show up to at least 50%. What's the average time spent by a volunteer per year? Like how many man hours does each volunteer typically put in each year? What, what are they required to? So there's an interesting thing with the, the federal government. You get a tax break if you put in more than 200 hours volunteering for search and rescue or volunteer firefighting. Um, so that is kind of the, the key that people try to hit that 200. Um, but we have uh, some of our executive, our training committee, our president probably putting in 1500 hours, which is, you know, I, I'm bad at math, but we're talking like 10 hours a week, right? It's just, it's just crazy the amount of time the administration side eats up. But uh, typical member is at least 200. I think last couple of years, I was four or 500 and I'm maybe an average member at most. Oh, wow. That's quite the involvement. It is a full-time hobby for sure, but a lot of that can be taken up on, um, you know, one or two big tasks. So uh, we were, a group of us went down to Manning Park about a month ago looking for uh, this young gentleman that went hiking on uh, Mount Frosty. And there was a few 12-hour days there, right? So those, um, it's pretty quick, you know, to get 24 hours in, in two days, including travel time. So um, it's not as, it's not like you're spending time on search and rescue every day. But when a big task does come out, um, it's pretty quick to uh, get some hours under your belt. So you mentioned you guys just had a rescue on Mount Frosty? Well, unfortunately, it wasn't successful. Oh, uh, it wasn't successful? No. So that was, um, that the hiker from Vancouver went to Manning Park. They found his car in the parking lot. Um, Hope and Princeton Star were originally tasked out with the search. They spent a day, couldn't find any signs. So they called in um, what's called mutual aid. So they put out the call for all search and rescue organizations within the area to come and help. So people from Vernon and Kelowna and Penticton, Oliver Soyuz, um, some of the lower mainland teams like Surrey, Abbotsford came out. And uh, we had, you know, some days there are 50, 75 searchers. And uh, we basically just covered Manning Park as hard as we could. And unfortunately, uh, there wasn't a heck of a lot of sign found. Um, so the search was eventually, the RCMP eventually called off the search um, after, oh, I don't know, a week or two. I see. That's unfortunate. What do you call an unsuccessful rescue? Do you have a certain word for it or, or how do you describe that? Yeah, we're fortunate we don't use that too often. Um, it's just, there's, the search has a couple of different phases. So it, this is, again, we report to the RCMP and ultimately they're in charge of everything, you know, we're just the volunteers. Um, so they're the ones who decide to spend the, the physical search. 
the case is still open because the gentleman is still missing. But the physical search um, has been suspended because we've literally covered um, the whole area or everything that the search managers believe could be searched in a safe and prudent manner. Right? I mean, obviously, we're not going to send people into crevices or, um, you know, undersides of glaciers or whatever. But um, we, we've tracked from covered as many of the hiking trails as we could. We had, uh, I think at one point there were three helicopters in the air. Um, there's there's only so much you can do, right? I mean, you know how difficult it is to track down a deer in the middle of the woods. Um, you, yeah. you just saw him, you saw him run into the forest. So it's, you know, you think, okay, I got a chance at this guy, but no, you know, if they uh, either don't want to be found or they're um, hunkered down, sometimes you're just not going to see the guy. Yeah, well, I mean, it's... Uh it's hard finding a deer with a, uh, even if they have a blood trail it's hard enough finding a deer never mind finding a human that you know might not or, or hopefully doesn't what would you say is the percentage of successful rescues that you guys are involved in we are i think there's probably one unsuccessful one a year where the um where the search uh doesn't end positively and that's for the entire interior right so not i i can't even recall the last time we've had one in Kelowna that was unsuccessful but some of these convergent searches where we go on a mutual aid task to help somebody out, they're uh, not always successful because by the time you call in other search and rescue organizations, a certain period of time has passed. So now you're, um, you're, you're expanding your search area. And um, if I may, this, this brings us around to um, kind of one of the key points with search and rescue is when people go out into a wilderness setting and don't leave a trip plan, a lot of times we don't have a last known position of the subject. We have a vehicle in a parking lot, for instance, Manning Park, we have a vehicle in a parking lot, but there is probably a dozen different hikes this person could have gone on. So how do you narrow it down? You, you know, you start asking subjects, uh, people that have other hikers, if they've seen this guy, but it is, it is a real challenge. And uh, I, you know, it, it's hard on the searchers and it's obviously even harder on the families, but there's, only so much you can do when you don't have a, a really accurate trip plan. Right. I think there was just, uh, they just recovered a, a missing hunter in uh, the Elk Valley area a couple of days ago, I believe. And I think the search and rescuers, they had three, he didn't have a trip plan, I'm presuming, because they didn't really have a, a certain location where they figured he would be. I think they, they had three um, locations that he was known to frequent. And I think they just... Uh, I think they tried all those areas and they found his car. And I think, unfortunately, yeah, he, uh, they found his body not too far from his car. And so that's the problem, right? Time is of the essence, as you're well aware, right? I mean, um, if, especially if you're separated from your vehicle, it's very, um, it's a little harder to survive unless you have like the tent essentials and you can light a fire and set up, you know, some sort of shelter. So if the searchers don't know where to start, and they have to spend a couple of days, or the police spend a couple of days flying around in a helicopter trying to locate the vehicle, to even start a search, um, you've lost valuable time, right? So again, that speaks to the importance of a trip plan, saying I'm going to be hunting in this area, I plan on, you know, doing this, this, and maybe that. So even just list the alternatives, because if you're anything like me, you know, I plan on going to one area, but suddenly you go, hey, you know what, that valley looks good, maybe I'll drive up there instead. But if that's part of my trip plan, at least somebody will know where to look. If somebody, say you have a trip plan and and uh, you have loved ones or, or people are expecting you back. Um, say you suspect somebody might be in trouble. When's a good time for a concerned party to, you know, hit that panic button? Um, that's something you, you tend to work out with the people that you left leave behind. Right. Um, you know, it tends to be dark. I hate to say it, but we get the call, you know, um, in the fall. So hunting season, you know, it's dark. Somebody isn't home by dark, so maybe the family gives them an extra hour, and then they call. There's no requirement to wait 24 hours or 48 hours, and unfortunately, we have had this before in the past, where people saw on TV that you got to wait 48 hours. That is not the case. You call right away, and you let the police make the decision, right? If it's um, an experienced hunter who's used to going out for multi-day trips, um, they might not launch a search right away. Where if it's uh, you know 18-year-old, um, first time hunting by himself, um, the, the cops might launch something that night. Um, so let them make the call. Um, but again, that's something that you set up with your party. When do you want to call into cavalry, as it were? Right. You said most of them occur at night. I, I'm assuming that makes your guys' job a lot harder. It, it, it is, you know, but it, it's just, it's, it's part of the deal, right? I mean, um, 
again, hunters, hunters are, are unique in this. Um, whereas hikers perhaps are goal oriented. So if we have a hiker who hasn't returned from a trip, um, you can go to where their, their staging is where their vehicle was. And they, there tends to be a path from their car to the summit, right. Or from their car along a hiking trail. So, you know, where to start. Whereas as a hunter, we're well aware, we kind of make our own thing, you know, like, Hey, that looks like a good spot or this, and we bushwhack and, um, so it's a little more challenging for sure for a hunter, um, yeah. but there's only so much you can do. Obviously, you know, if we can get a heli in the air, which tends to not happen at night, but um, the light from a helicopter or, you know, searches calling out with whistles, um, that sort of thing. Um, you can do a sound sweep. You can maybe um, use lights as well to try to attract somebody. But um, to be honest, the best thing, if the, uh, you know, the shit does hit the fan, excuse me. Uh, sorry, if things do go sideways, um, you know, you, a, a smart hunter would just hunker down, light a fire, pull out the tarp and say, you know what? Looks like I'm spending the night in the woods and I'll yeah. get out in the morning. That makes sense. So, yeah, I mean, that's one thing about hunting. I mean, it's it's hard to predict where the animals are going to be and, and what they're going to do. And and if you're tracking or, or following a specific animal, then, you know, it's hard to come up with this, with an exact location of where you're going to be. But what would you recommend for, you mentioned trip plan. What, what would be a good trip plan for, you know, say a hunter going out on a, on a day trip? So that's, that's a really good point there. There is an actual, if you want to get really specific, adventuresmart.ca um, has a trip plan you can download and just fill out, you know, they, theirs is quite detailed. So what vehicle you're driving, what you're wearing, um, what your primary objective is, where you're going, things like that. Um, at the very least, um, people should know where to find your vehicle and where you're planning on heading. And like I said, a lot of times these change um, or you might have multiple spots that you're gonna, gonna check out. But if you list them all, it's gonna make everybody's life easier, right? So just, just the fundamentals of, you know, uh, if you're carrying a cell phone, if you, um, are equipped for spending the night, um, things like that. Um, and it's, it just, even at the worst case scenario, it's just a simple text to, uh, you know, family back home. Hey, I'm going hunting in, you know, um, Gowdy road area. I'm going to be doing these three roads. I plan on, you know, uh, truck hunting, or I'm going to, you know, go to a tree stand or whatever, just let people know as much as they can. And, um, it's going to make everybody's life easier down the road definitely yeah i mean most of my hunts are three four or you know sometimes longer and they're backpack trips so um but i carry one of those i have a spot x that i carry just because uh you know my wife was she would absolutely not let me go if i didn't have that with me just so i can uh, stay in contact with her on a daily basis but do you use a, a spot x or one of those in reaches yourself in reach yeah i'm i'm a fan of in reach myself as um is kosar we i think we've got four or five of them for tracking searchers, but um, either or works. Any personal locator beacon. Um, now they're not perfect, right? Obviously, batteries can die, and there have been issues where they'll send out the wrong coordinates. There's a margin of error sometimes, oh, but yeah. it's certainly better than being middle of nowhere where there's no cell service, um, and there's very, you know, it's very difficult to attract anybody's attention, right? So this is, I, I think they're, what are they? You can get them for a couple hundred bucks plus a subscription fee. Yeah, they're they're not much anymore. I think I paid uh, two hundred bucks for. I have the Spot X Messenger just so I can communicate back and forth, and I I pay I think fifteen bucks a month. So you know, really, uh, it, it's not a lot. No, that and I I know for a fact they have been using successful rescues before, um, a fair number of times. There's, they've also been some false alarms. These things occasionally go off, but um, literally, I think your life is worth two hundred and fifty bucks. I mean, that's the price of a. A decent knife. I mean, you can't even get a decent scope for that anymore, right? So, no. Well, that's just it, and that's the thing. Yeah, guys go out and they spend five hundred dollars on a hunting jacket, and you know, three hundred dollars on a set of pants, and they're spending a couple grand on a rifle. So, really, um, what's a few extra hundred bucks? So, one question I have for you that I've always wondered: when you hit that SOS button, how does that action get to you guys? Okay, that's that's a really good, uh, really good point. So. Um, it communicates via satellite, right? So the same satellites that use, um, you know, give you coordinates and the GPS. Um, we'll take this signal and they'll send it off. And I think Spot is based in Texas. So it'll go to a central agency in Texas who will find out who the local agency is. So your Spot, um, even though it's registered to you in Kelowna, you could be using it in, you know, the Caribou or you could be using it, you know, in the far north, right? So they will find out where that um, 
where the uh, distress call came from and they'll contact the local agency there. So the RCMP in, you know, uh, Lillooette or whatever. And then it's up to the, that RCMP to initiate the search, right? And they tend to be pretty proactive on that. So when a distress signal comes out, it's usually um, deemed to be uh, real. So they'll, they'll get in touch with search and rescue right away. Gotcha. So say hunters are out in the back country and say the unfortunate happens. What would you, re- like, how would you suggest preparing, well, just say for instance, that a hunter goes out and he's truck hunting, but he sees a deer and he gets out of his truck and he decides to go pursue that uh, deer and he trips and breaks his leg and he's unable to get back to his truck. What should he do then next? Like what's the next step for him to ensure that he's going to be alive in the morning? What would you recommend? So that brings us back to the 10 essentials, um, the, um, which is kind of a, a go-to for whatever sport you're involved in. But, you know, so everything, the 10 essentials includes everything from, uh, you know, fire starter, a little a shelter of some sort, whether it's a, a big plastic bag or a tarp or something like that, a little bit of food and water, some extra clothes, headlamp, and I have some sort of navigation, right? So whether it's a personal locator beacon or a GPS or whatever. So let's be honest. Um, if you've broken a leg, um, that's about as bad as it's going to get, right? Unless you've got a compound fracture or you've ruptured a, you know, art, artery or something like that. But generally a broken leg is a broken leg. And of all the searches or all the rescues we do, there's maybe two a year where the subject is critical. That if we don't get an intervention in place right away, the subjects could die. Most of the time it's, you know, somebody's fallen, they've broken a wrist, they've broken a leg, they've, uh, you know, broken their knee they're not getting any worse it's just they're in a lot of pain and they're not mobile but that's the extent of it right so you got to be prepared to hunker down so if you file the trip plan or you have a spot and you can set out an sos then you got to look after food uh, sorry shelter and a fire and um, i'm sure every competent hunter out there can light a fire in just about any condition right i mean worst case scenario cheat and bring them some of these fire starters or whatever but once you got a fire going and a big tarp over top of you or a plastic bag suddenly it's not quite as bad as it would be if you're just you know lying with a broken leg in the middle of a you know wet forest right so just be prepared to wait then yeah yeah well i guess it's i guess that's why it's a good idea for every hunter before they set out in the bush to uh you know even if you have a day pack but just to make sure that you have uh um, essential stuff in there for survival i know a lot of a lot of uh, friends and family, even if, you know, if they're going on a day trip for hunting, you know, numerous times I've seen them not take anything. They just, they have the comfort of their vehicle. So they they figure they're not really worried about it. But I mean, you know, even if you get a flat tire or your truck breaks down or your truck dies, you still, you still have to be prepared for an emergency situation. So. Yeah. Well, that's actually, that's a lot closer to home than you think. Um, I think two years ago we had a gentleman, um, perished on a hunting trip in the Philpot Road area. And this man, he was very, very experienced. I think he was in his early 70s, but he had been hunting, you know, 65 of those years, right? The man knew everything there was to know about it. Um, He told people he was going to go hunting in this area, um, gassed up his truck and drove around and um, he continued to expand the search area. He spent some time hunting. And uh, when he didn't come home that night, we were called. So this was October. I believe October 2018, we were called and we got out there and it started snowing, right? So the conditions deteriorated rapidly and hit any sign, right? So any tracks that he would have made through mud puddles or whatever were now obliterated. So we searched for six days before um, another group of hunters ended up finding his body. Um, And it turns out that his truck had um, got stuck in a creek crossing. So, you know, sometimes uh, logging companies will put some logs across a creek this guy's truck got stuck there um he wasn't really mobile but he decided he was gonna hike out and um he he started walking and he obviously didn't make it very far before he succumbed to that snowstorm um so um if 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 things would have been a bit different if he would have been a little more specific on his trip plan exactly what roads he was going to take if he would have been hunting with a partner right there's a bit of a saying in search and rescue that um you know, if you have an accident by yourself, that's a tragedy. If you have an accident and somebody's with you, then it's a witness tragedy. But if you've got three people, then somebody's gone for help. And so this guy, unfortunately, was by himself. So there's no one to go for help. Um, he didn't stay with his vehicle. Um, he didn't have proper clothing, right? Because he was truck hunting. You don't really need much, right? You can yeah. truck hunt in a t-shirt for crying out loud. Yeah. 
Um, so he didn't have any of that gear, right? Um, he did. I don't know whether he had any fire starter, but he, um, you know, we didn't stay with the vehicle and light a fire, stay warm. I mean, you can stay in your vehicle until, you know, you run your gas tank. Yeah. So he made it just a series of minor little errors, right? That, that came back to, to bite him in the butt. And it's really sad because by all accounts, I mean, there was family and friends out looking for this guy. He had a, a huge support network, right? He, he was a really popular man and a very competent outdoorsman, but just a couple of little mistakes add up as we all aware, right? Yeah. Um, you go tra- tracking down, you know, you, you did a bad shot, you got a blood trail that you're following and, you know, you're, you're now a kilometer or two from your vehicle. And like you said, you t- break your ankle, like, and suddenly you realize, oh, I left my pack back in the truck. All I got with me is a knife and a bone saw or whatever. Um, stuff suddenly gets real. And yeah. it's, it's being prepared for these little things, right? I mean, you can have a, a basically the 10 essentials in a pack that's, you know, a three, four liter little pack, right? A hip pack, um, just, just enough to keep you alive for a couple of days until help comes. Yeah, no, I, I remember that incident. So uh, that was unfortunate. And, you know, the, he did have a lot of experience and he was probably, he was probably stubborn. And well, like my, my dad, you know, you tell him all the time and he just says, well, you know, I've, I've done it a million times and, you know, nothing bad's going to happen. But you, like you said, it's not, it's not the one big bad thing. It's just the combination and the compounding small things that, that add up to, uh, to an unfortunate trip. Yeah, it's like a car accident, right? I mean, I, I haven't been in one in a while, but I still wear my seatbelt just in case. And it's it's the same like this. And I, you know, I try really hard to be that guy that, that brings us the stuff with all the time. Um, not perfect either. But when you start seeing the, um, the tasks that we've been on, the ones that are unsuccessful where the subject doesn't make it, it, it tends to be the unprepared. Um, those that, um, that are packing all the gear, they, they just hunker down and wait. Um, and we've had a few of those last year. I believe we had a, a young hunter that was separated from his dad. And um, his dad basically called us, said, hey, we were in this area. I don't know where my kid is. Boom, we went in and um, the kid was, he was well prepared. He was just a bit, bit nervous. You know, it was late at night and he's all by himself. But he had, some, he was, had enough warm clothes with him. He just hunkered down and wait. And then we came in and got him out. I think he was back home by 3 a.m. How old was the kid? I think he was 18. He was just a, uh, just a young guy. I've been walking through the bush at night and, uh, and have my headlamp quit on me and it, it's, it sucks. So anyway, at least I, at least I made it out of there. That's a successful hunt, to be honest. That's, you know, <laughs> you come back alive and if you come back with some meat, that's a bonus. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, trip plan. Can you just give us a sort of, uh, can you just kind of navigate me through that? What's the foundations of a good trip plan? Uh, just the fundamentals. So again, if you go to adventuresmart.ca, that would be the, you know, the first place you, I would start. Um, and you can download an app, which is basically, you know, tells the who, what, when, where, why. So who is going and who do you want to send your trip plan to? You know, where, where are you going? When are you going? What are you wearing? What supplies and equipment do you have with you? Um, and what's your objective? So um, hunters, obviously different than hikers, different than mountain bikers, different than, well, we also do searches for you know people with dementia and little kids right and everybody yeah is a bit different in the woods right um like i said a hiker will is very goal oriented going to go to the summit or hike a trail whereas a hunter you know um probably the most complicated ones to be honest um what looks good to one hunter obviously isn't necessarily the same to another hunter right so um if you could lay that out where are you going and what are you planning on doing um, even just like you were saying, you know, if you're, someone's going elk hunting, that's going to be a little bit different if, well, we don't have antelope here, but, um, you know, if you're going to do, um, you know, white-tailed deer, right. Somebody who's yeah. goose hunting or grouse hunting may be sticking to roads, whereas, a, a deer hunter may not. Right. So letting, putting as much information as you can. Now I know it's a bit onerous to do this all the time, but, um, even if you can just, you know, answer those who, what, when, where, why questions and send it off to you know your partner um you know whether it's a hunting partner or a wife or girlfriend back home it's it really increases the odds of a successful search uh we talked a bit about uh um you know having the 10 essentials and stuff what would you recommend for like a first aid kit like what do you what do you pack in your first aid kit so that's that's a really good question now a first aid kit should only contain the stuff that you are competent in using right um, you don't need, uh, bag valve masks or any of that, if you don't know how to use them and, um, aren't trained in that. Right. But the fundamentals, um, you, you think of, um, 
accidents that will happen hunting, right? So you're talking broken bones, um, maybe punctures in heaven. <clears throat> you know, really hope there, there won't be a gunshot wound, but that is a possibility. Yeah, or I guess so, a, a, a bear attack is, is, is another uh, one that's, uh, that's pretty serious. So, so some major trauma is going on here, right? So you're going to yeah. need to stop the bleeding or stabilize the wound, right? So um, these things called SAMs, well, let's face it, you don't even need to bring with a splint. You know, I mean, you can use uh, sticks if you have to, just to, you know, if you've got a broken tibia or fibia or knee or something like that. Um, that and something to keep the sticks attached to your leg so your leg is now stable. Um, that would be about all you'd need. Uh, if you've got a, an open wound, um, some, uh, some pads and something to attach them, you know, a tensor bandage or something like that. Um, maybe a little pain meds. If you've, uh, you know, I've, I keep some Tylenol three around that I've had from when I did my back a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, that's one. Yeah. Just, that's right? one thing I keep too, is, uh, I always have ibuprofen with me in my first aid kit as well. It's for me, it's a must. <laughs> It's those little things and maybe um, some antihistamine, right? I mean, uh, I, I just read an article a while back where uh, allergies tend to actually, um, in some people, they get worse as they get older, right? So you might not have been affected by a bee sting when you're 10, but now you're 30 or 40, maybe it affects you worse, right? So oh, yeah. simple little antihistamine in your in your pack. Um, and that would be, uh, that, that could, well, literally it could save your life, but um, at least could make you a lot more comfortable if you do get um, nailed by a, by a bee and suddenly have a reaction or your partner has a reaction, right? Maybe buddy didn't know that he's allergic to what do we got now? Murder hornets running around. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and not, not going to try to jinx <laughs> anybody, but um, suddenly that that's, that's a bit of a game changer, right? From a, you know, a honeybee that gets you, that's just an inconvenience. Yeah. Well, those that, things, I, I think you can hit those things with your rifle. They're so big. <laughs> that's yeah, exactly I'm looking for recipes thanksgiving recipes now for murder hornets that's one thing i struggled with i went on a, a seven day goat hunt this year and i i really struggled with my first aid kit i i had everything but the kitchen sink in my first aid kit i always you know thinking well better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it but just the weight of it so i that was one of the things that i i did a complete makeover and yeah i, I went back to like you said just more of the essentials um than all the there, other there stuff is- and I think you've hit on it. I mean, when people start thinking first aid kit, I mean, you know, you start off with a couple of band-aids and, um, you know, maybe a few aspirin, right? And then if somebody gets hurt or whatever on a, a trip, um, then you kind of realize, oh man, I wish I would have had more. So then you tend to overpack. And for a while, I remember after getting my OFA3, I used to drive around in my car with basically a trauma bag, you know? I mean, I didn't have the training necessarily to use all this stuff, but I had enough equipment to... Um, that you know that it looked like a small emergency room and and now i'm kind of in the middle where you think okay so what are people going to die from right i mean you know you got your abc so airway breathing um bleeding sorry and um oh, i can't even remember the abcs now hang on here um airways breathing circulation so um you know if, if they're really bleeding hard if they fall on a rock or something and there's they're spurting blood okay so you need something to stop that so um some some gauze that you can put over the wound and tape on uh, maybe even this new coagulating stuff i haven't been trained in that but i hear that's supposed to be a good thing to stop the bleeding right um something to stabilize a wound so again the tensor bandage and some sticks will work um and then be realistically um hypothermia is a huge issue um you know is you know sure you've broken your leg that's not going to kill you but now you suddenly can't move and you're wearing blue jeans and a t-shirt and it's you know, now two degrees above at night. Um, so something to keep your, you warm. So lighting the fire or um, one of those emergency blankets. Um, and that'll, it's not going to be a fun night, but that'll get you through the night, right? Exactly. You mentioned the ABCs there. I, I guess it'd be a good idea for all hunters to take some sort of first aid. I have, I've had first aid courses. So I have the basic, I, uh, you know, the essentials for first aid, you know, CPR and stuff and that I've had to take just through through work and, and WCB requires, but I guess for those hunters who don't have it, I guess that's, that's probably a good idea, isn't it? So, yeah, that's, um, and it just came back to me, of course, airway breathing circulation, but, um, the, um, just, just the basic, let's be honest, um, heart attacks get people all the time, right? So knowing how to do CPR, um, will keep, will keep somebody alive. You know, like I said, if you got a group of three, somebody's gone for help and you can do CPR on, on your buddy, 
um, that's going to go a long way. And that's a basic, you know, what is it, a four hour course? Um, it doesn't take much. And um, the rest of it is, is pretty much common sense. Like I said, I took a, a wilderness, uh, I can't even remember what it was, wilderness first responder, I believe, um, course. And it's basically most interventions that you do, it, it's hard to do them wrong, right? Doing something tends to be better than nothing. Um, not a lot of interventions actually cause harm to the patient, right? So if somebody's bleeding, you know, hey, you got to stop the bleeding. Somebody's not breathing, well, hey, you got to get them breathing, right? Um, it's um, it's not a perfect world, unfortunately, because we, we've got so many variables when it comes to hunting accidents. Um, but, you know, if you look at the fundamentals, um, just knowing how to deal with the basics um, yeah. is, is all that really matters. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one thing. I mean, you spend enough time in the bush and, you know, unfortunately um, it's inevitable that something's going to happen. And myself, I've never needed uh, any emergency assistance. So knock on wood, but uh, hopefully I never do, but it sure is good to have you guys out there when we do need you. Everything is volunteer. How is COSAR funded though? How do you guys pay for, you know, your sleds, your snowmobiles and, and all that stuff and your training? There's a little, yeah, a few different ways. So um, donations for sure go a long way. Um, we've got a donation tab on our website and on our Facebook page, and that has bought some really valuable equipment. Um, uh, we've, we've got a couple in town that um, cashed in a bunch of bottles and, and gave us enough money that we got this thing called a trail rider, which is basically um, a stretcher that allows a subject to sit upright. Um, it's got a wheel underneath, so you can basically get somebody out of uh, the woods with um, just two people, right? If they're not mobile, if they've got a lower body injury, right? Um, so donations are a big part of it. We also um, apply for a lot of grants. We've got um, I've literally somebody on the executive that's in charge of fundraising and they spend a lot of their time um, hitting up the provincial government for gaming grants. So from lottery ticket sales and uh, casinos and such. And that's, that's helped um, the regional district and the city of Kelowna are big supporters we basically have a hall that's um, pretty much rent free. There's some sort of uh, deal worked out where um, the city takes care of most of the costs. And then emergency management, British Columbia. So the guys that are in charge of not just search and rescue, but literally, um, you know, emergencies um, at a large scale, um, they help us out with funding for um, some things as well. So we're all volunteers. Um, we don't get paid for our time, but we'll get paid uh, mileage if we use our personal vehicles. If we wreck any of our personal equipment on a task, we get reimbursed for that. Um, there's a process to do it, but um, so it's not, um, time is about the biggest out-of-pocket expense. Um, not that you're ever gonna make any money and there's always these hidden costs, right? You're in the woods for 12 hours and you've just you know, eaten through an entire box of Costco uh, granola bars, but um, it's just, you know, it's, it's part of the deal, right? Um, can, can just anyone donate? Is there a way to donate to you guys? Yeah, well, COSAR.ca website or our Facebook page is a donate button. Yeah, th those are the, the two primary ways. Um, there's most equipment. I think we're generally set for equipment right now. I mean, obviously, as you know, things wear out, um, we're, we're looking at replacing another one of our trucks. So we've got an F-350 that's um, been worked pretty hard over the years. And we're looking at replacing that. Um, so that will probably be our next big purchase. Um, but a, a few years of gaming grants. And, and unfortunately, it is a bit of a lottery, um, these gaming grants. So you, you apply for funding and um, some years you get a lot, some years you only get a little. Um, we're expecting next year to be a little light because obviously the casinos have been closed. Right. Um, there is, the province is also, um, I think it was last year, passed legislation for um, petrol funding for search and rescue. So there is, it used to be a, a, a three-year rolling funding program. So every three years, they'd give um, a few million dollars to all the, the 80 search and rescue organizations in the province, but it looks like it's going to be a permanent thing going forward. So that money helps. So there's a bunch of different pools of money that we, we try to, um, try try to access. access. Yeah. And it's, I mean, we're, we're pretty lean, not going to lie. I mean, you know, we, we don't use helicopters nearly as much as, you know, guys in the lower mainland where they, you know, let's face it, the TV, you know, global TV can literally see the guys flying into the North Shore Mountains, right? So it's it's for good news stories. Yeah. Um, here we don't have quite the publicity, so um, we don't have quite 
as many resources, but you know, we try to uh, leverage what we can get as right. much as we can. You mentioned helicopters there. How do you guys get access to helicopters? Do you don't have your own helicopters, do you, or do you? No, we don't. Again, that's where our search manager. So once they start a search, um, they have to, you know, and our search managers, we got some pretty experienced guys, right? Guys that have, have seen, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of tasks and they, they can make a pretty good judgment call. So if you've got a young man, like last year, we had a, um, a snowmobiler, Gray Stokes, and he was uh, 12 or 13 and he got separated from his family and he was out overnight. So we had searchers going all night trying to find this guy and the search manager recognized the severity of the situation. So he made a call to the emergency management, British Columbia, and said, look, you know, we've got a, a young man. Um, it's, you know, been getting minus 12, I believe it was. We need air support. So they literally had a helicopter. I think they had two helicopters in the air at first light. Um, so um, we'll make the, the case for air support, but it's up to the province to uh, ultimately fund it. Unfortunately, that, that doesn't always happen. I mean, it's, you know, politics, they make the, the call. Um, and I know a lot of times, again, because we are tasked out by RCMP, um, a lot of times the police will use their helicopter, their air resource to start, right? While we're waiting for the province to, to okay a helicopter, the, the cops will fly around and, you know, whenever, it, I forget what the local helicopter is, Air One or something like that, but um, we'll use their helicopter. That must have been pretty scary for that uh, young man, 12 years old. Yeah, minus 12 at night. That's just that. That's happened a few times. Um, this young guy was, again, reasonably prepared. He was with his snowmobile, so he had a little bit of gear with him as well. I think he, he had like a dozen of those hot packs that he... Uh, oh, yeah. That he, yeah. Uh, so he, he hunkered down by a tree and he just, you know, um, it was an uncomfortable night, but um, he survived. Um, yeah. There's been a few where... Um, Last year, year before, backside of big white, a skier went out of bounds and um, ended up going in the wrong direction. And that was a cold one. That was like minus 22. And our guys got there. Um, the man was wa- walking in circles now, just trying to stay warm. He'd, he'd forgotten, but he didn't even worry about getting back out. He was just trying not to freeze to death. And our guys, uh, two of our, our snowmobilers showed up and, uh, and uh, they lit a massive fire and got this guy warmed up. And um, because it was so close to dawn, they just decided, waited until the morning, and then they helicoptered him out um, oh, yeah. because he was quite hypothermic at the time, and they're worried about doing more damage. So they, yeah. as opposed to ride him out in the back of a sled, they figured, you know what, we'll wait a couple more hours by the big fire, and then we'll yank him out in the helicopter. But that one was, that one was pretty close. Um, I, I don't know. I'm not gonna say within hours, but it was, um, it was. I don't think the, the guy could have lasted much longer on that one. Oh, well, well, good thing you guys got there. Do you guys get that a lot? A lot of uh, skiers that go out of bounds? There's there's some, yeah. We're, we're not quite like the North, again, the North Shore guys. Um, and most of this, you know, and I, I'm not going to lie, I'm a skier and I go out of bounds all the time, right? But um, I'll, I'll go with with a group of people and I, I tend to not explore as much as perhaps some, uh, you know, younger, more aggressive guys. Um, I, I know the routes back, right? I have the equipment and um, and I have a partner. I have comms, right? So I'm bringing my my in reach with um, a little more prepared, right? Than um, guys that just just go up in their resort gear and then get into trouble, right? So we get um, a couple couple skiers a year for sure every year, a uh, couple snowmobilers. Um, how do, how do hunters fit into that equation? How many search and rescue missions are associated with, you know, uh, missing or, or hurt hunters? Uh, there'll be a couple, couple a year. Um, I, again, not, you know, uh, the, I'll be honest, most of, we do, a, a, the bulk of the works tends to be tourists or people that, um, you know, unfamiliar with the area and get lost. Uh, occasionally that happens to hunters, right? A truck will break down, truck will get stuck. And of course, it's only going to happen when you're out of cell range, right? Yeah. So, you know, you told somebody you're going to hunt in the Christian Valley. Well, that's, that's a pretty big area. And um, you don't come back that night. Wife panics, calls 911. And it's like, wow, that's suddenly realized how big the Christian Valley is and how many spots there are. So, you know, you don't even know where to start. So you bring in the helicopter and start looking for that. So the, these will happen a couple of times a year, yeah. but not a ton. Hunters are pretty, let's be honest. You, you know, I think a lot of people, you start truck hunting until you get more and more competent. And and they take that outdoors, I think, a little more seriously than, say, um, 
somebody from the lower mainland who decides to go try mountain biking some of the, the trails here and gets lost. Yeah, well, and there's so much technology today that hunters have at their disposal. And I'm starting to plan my hunts actually already for, for next fall. So, you know, and I'm already looking at topo maps and, and stuff like that. And I'm going to have a pretty, pretty damn good idea of the area uh, by the time I get there. So, And then, of course, you leave all that information with somebody, right? So they would know where where to look if you, you happen to spend a few extra days out there, right? You know what? I don't, I don't even, I don't think I do that. I don't think I actually sit down with my wife. Sure. Say, Hey, here's a map. Here's where I'm going to be. I'm going to be in this location. Cause when you're doing species specific hunts, uh, like a mountain goat, you're not going to get too far off track. You're going to be just because of the terrain and the amount of time it takes to get there. Uh, and you can only carry so much food for, for so long. So, um, you're not going to be, you're not going to veer too far off your, of your set path. That's one thing I should definitely start doing. Even just a quick, you know, a couple of uh, photos of the maps sent to her, right? And then worst case scenario, you're not back. They could, they could send a chopper over to look at these high probability areas and, you know, oh, hey, there's a, there's a fire coming from this area. A guy's got a campfire set up. So maybe we'll just stop in and see whether he's okay or not. You know, assuming that your spot doesn't work or something like that. It just yeah. makes, yeah, makes everybody's life easier, but it's when, you know, the old I'm going hunting, and you'll see this all the time on Cassinet, right? Police are asking the public's help in locating a missing, you know, whatever, 30-year-old. Um, and they have a picture of his truck because he just basically told his family he's going hunting and didn't say where, didn't say when he'd be back. But it's been a day now. And now we're looking for, you know, a grade four, three, four F-150 somewhere in the North Okanagan. Yeah. Um, and don't even know where to start, right? So that's the problem. With truck hunting and, and day hunting, you know, I think you feel that you do have that security of the vehicle and, you know, the worst case scenario is you're going to get a flat tire. But like you said, you know, you, you start, you're not finding animals in the area you think you will. And then you start looking at new areas and then, yeah, you start, you, of course, there's no cell service and then your engine blows and then it's dark. You know, when you're walking, everything looks different than when you're driving. And then when you're, it gets dark and, and when you're truck hunting, yeah, you might not have those essentials you need for an overnight uh, stay so yeah it's a, it's definitely good to plan for plan for the worst and hope for the best i guess yeah exactly you know and even just you know realizing that hey staying with a truck lighting a big fire will be better you know yeah. probably more likely to be found that way um but if you do walk if you have enough clothes to stay warm for and lord knows we can cover a lot of area truck hunting you know you yes. can you can get way back and next thing you know like wow 50k is that's a long long day not gonna lie yeah, well, and and just the amount of road access that there is. Uh, I mean, you you go in the back country, and yeah, there's guys are are cutting roads for their quads, and then sh sure enough, you got ten quads going through there, and then all of a sudden you have a pickup truck going through there, and then guys are making roads where they shouldn't be making roads, and and yeah, that's how you get into, that's how you get yourself into trouble. Yeah, when the, and that, that's a problem too, right? When these roads don't even appear on maps, it's, it's yeah. tough to launch a search. So if you know. Um, even if you can narrow that area down a little bit. And like I said, if it's a broad area, maybe they bring in the aircraft right away to, to see whether they can see anything from the sky, which isn't always as good as it sounds because a lot of times, especially in the Okanagan, right, our falls tend to be that gray overcast. Um, yeah. Helicopters are useless, right? Um, right. So it doesn't always work that way, right? Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. And then the guy, and if your rescue team is... You know, they're looking at a map and if they know the guy's truck hunting, then they're going to be just most likely they're just going to be looking for uh, road access and stuff like that. And if guys are making roads that aren't on any maps, it's going to be harder to find them in the in the unfortunate event of a, an emergency. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, Ed, uh, uh, we're getting uh, on an hour here and uh, I know you got lots to do and, and I want to thank you for for coming on today and, and sharing us your knowledge and telling us a bit about uh, search and rescue um absolutely my pleasure um so yeah on that note um check out cosar.ca our yeah, website we if you, and adventuresmart.ca for um you know the, the 10 essentials and uh, uh the trip plan app um, yeah. makes everybody's life easier there you betcha now i i know you're a hunter but do you think you got time to to share a quick hunting story with us what's your most memorable hunting trip I unfortunately am not an epic hunter. I am full on meat hunter. And like I said, my folks live in Grand Forks. Um, so go down there, spend some quality time with my dad who's in his eighties. And uh, we load up on whitetails. Um, between the two of us, we got three this year down there. Um, muley deer up in Kamloops. Um, 
it's pure meat. And I wish I was like you. I wish I was um, a little more adventurous and I would try the elk and the goat. But unfortunately, as a college professor, the, you know, that's my busy season, September, October, November. So it's tough to take a big chunk of time off then. Yes, so, uh, I hear you. Right. So um, for now, that's that's just it. Go down to Grand Forks and man, uh, if you can find access to some private property down there that's outside of the city. Um, yeah, I, I don't even you know what? I shouldn't call myself a hunter. I'm uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's um, there's there's a lot of deer early in the season that um, that, that just absolutely gorge themselves down there with so some. Um, but it, yeah, I'm not going to argue. I absolutely love venison and that's a great spot for it. Yeah. Yeah. I hunt, uh, my parents have a place in Rock Creek, so I spend a lot of time in, in 814, 815. So I'm 814, 815 all the way, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I've been uh, fortunate to take a few elk and quite a few deer out of, out of that area. And, and recently in the last, I think four years, we started turkey hunting. So, um, I know Grand Forks has a lot of turkey around there, so I'm sure be poking around there next spring. I've seen those around. That's awesome. Yeah, that's um, that's on my to-do list for sure. Yeah, right? the, the, the it, it's cake. fun. It's fun. I'll have to try that. So where yeah. did you get your elk in that Rock Creek area? I uh, too specific. Yeah, hmm. I got to be as clandestine as possible here because, uh, well, you know what, you know what, you know what hunters are like. North of Rock Creek, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Yeah, north of Rock Creek. Um, north of Rock Creek, I, I've actually taken two elk out of that area, so been pretty fortunate. But there, it's it's uh, it's a lot of work. It wasn't easy by any means. You know, I see a lot of moose um, on the east side of Rock Creek uh, when I'm snowmobiling or snowshoeing um, in the backcountry. Is that um, right? He- heading towards yeah. Um, I've seen moose there, never in the hunting season, never in, you know, not, not that I've ever had LEH or anything, but I've seen um, in winter, like in the deep, deep snow, they come down. No kidding. And yeah. And that was, that was a bit of a surprise. Well, not a lot. Like, okay, I'll be honest. I think I've seen at least two, maybe three times, um, which was complete shock. Cause you see the tracks and you go, is this elk or what? Like, I'm not that, you know, first at uh, telling the difference in tracks. And then sure enough, there's one down there just absolutely eating the little, you know, the heck out of a small tree and uh, go, wow. Okay. So this is moose. I wish I would have known that, you know, two months earlier. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, it's funny. I put in for an LEH in 814 every year and I've never gotten an LEH straw. And I mean, I don't want to get going down this rabbit hole of LEH straws, but my cousin in the last seven years has had two LEH straws in region 814. My brother had this year in 2020 he had an leh draw and yeah you know we do see sign of moose everywhere and man we searched and searched and searched we could not find a, a moose for the life of us but yeah i'm glad like i like i said I, i've seen tracks i've seen scat i've never never actually seen a moose in 814 so i'm i'm definitely happy to hear that you have that'll keep my keep me optimistic again thanks ed for coming out uh, it's been a lot of fun and uh, hopefully we can get you on on the show again sometime yeah well thanks for having me kevin i really appreciate it. good luck out there Okay, we'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Okay, everybody, thanks again for tuning in to the Focus Hunting Podcast. Before you go, I want to remind you all, Hunters for BC, BC's Interior Chapter SCI. If you guys aren't already members, make sure you go to their webpage, click that membership button, sign up today.